On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Tavia Sills, who was 18 years old and five months pregnant when she was murdered in Shreveport, Louisiana on September 9, 2008. Tavia disappeared after being picked up by the father of her unborn child. He said he dropped Tavia off at her sister's house, but she never returned home and no one ever saw Tavia again. Three days later, on September 12th, her body was found floating in a pond. She had been shot to death. As police began their investigation into Tavia's disappearance and death, they began to learn the whole truth, and not only who killed her, but the senseless reason why. This is Tavia's story. The story this week brings us back to an all-too-familiar theme, a young pregnant woman brutally murdered. We know that homicide is the leading cause of death for pregnant women, but it will never not be shocking. And it's not just one death. In most cases, it's two, because the baby also dies. It's unimaginable to think of the evil that it takes to do something like that, to kill a woman who is carrying a baby. but. Time and time again, we see stories like Tavia's. Tavia was just 18 years old, and she was looking forward to her future. Despite the fact that she was going to be a mom, she was determined to not let it stop her from pursuing her dreams. But her young life was cut short. Although Tavia's murderer was found, her story is a stark reminder of why getting pregnant for some women is the most dangerous time of their lives. Sadly, Tavia would find out in a devastating way. Like I said, Tavia was only 18 years old in 2008. Born January 22, 1990, she was the second youngest of four, with a younger sister, an older sister, and a brother. As a child, her family described her as bubbly, a sometimes silly child who made everyone laugh someone who loved to help other people. And she grew into a caring young woman who loved spending time with her family and friends, especially her siblings, who she adored. When her sister became a mom, Tavia was there to help her. She loved being an aunt. Growing up, when Tavia wasn't at school, she spent her time going to church with family, and she was also a member of the ROTC. Her mom, Vicki Burton, said that Tavia also took a lot of pride in her appearance. She loved clothes and she loved getting dressed up. In many ways, Tavia had a very normal life, surrounded by loving family and community. Vicki said that school was very important to her daughter, and she had dreams of being a nurse. Because she loved helping others, being a nurse was really a perfect career for Tavia. As she finished her senior year of high school, her future looked bright. She had been accepted to Southern University where she was planning to major in nursing. But after the end of her senior year, Tavia found out that she was pregnant. Now, having a baby wasn't exactly part of the plan. However, Tavia was actually excited about having her baby and her family was supportive of her decision. By that time, Tavia was on her way to college, and so her family was determined to not let being a mom stop her from going to school. They vowed to help her and do what was needed to support the new mom once the baby was born. Tavia told her family that the father of her baby was a young man named Lamondre Tucker, who she had known since middle school. According to her family and friends, they had dated on and off since middle school, and Lamondre was someone who was always around. As focused as Tavia was on school and her future, Lamandre was someone she would always make time for. During her senior year of high school, they started dating again. Lamandre was a football star and was a very popular player, especially among the girls. But Tavia was also smitten by him, and they had known each other for years. And so when she found out that she was pregnant, a part of her may have imagined that they would be a happy family. Lamandre also seemed to have a bright future ahead of him. As a star football player, he was getting offers from colleges all over the country. 
According to Tavia's family, although having a baby wasn't part of either of their plans, Lamandre also appeared to be excited about the baby. He told her mom that he planned to do whatever it took to take care of his child. In the months after finding out that she was pregnant, Tavia began preparing for the arrival of her baby. She had found out that she was having a boy, and she had decided that she was going to name him Tavion. She began buying things for her son, like clothes and baby toys. She even bought a stroller. Quote, Tay was so excited about this child. All she talked about is how she was going to take care of her son and what she was going to do with him, her mom Vicky said in an interview with the Shreveport Times. In the fall of 2008, Tavia began classes at Southern University. Her baby was due in January, and so it was an exciting time for her. So much change was on the horizon and some uncertainty, but with her family support, she was poised to do a lot of great things in her life, and she was excited about her future. Sadly, Tavia had no idea that everything was about to change. On September 9th, 2008, Lamandre told Tavia that he wanted to take her to meet his sister. Lamandre told Tavia that he told his sister about the baby, and so she wanted to meet her. He came to her house and picked her up, but before she left, she asked her mom to pray with her. There was something that was giving Tavia some pause about going with Lamandre that day, but she decided to go anyway. A few hours later, Lamandre returned to Vicky's home, but Tavia was not with him. He told Vicky that he had gone to his sister's house, but she wasn't home, and so he was planning to bring Tavia back to her house, but she asked him to drop her off at her sister's apartment, at the Prince Village Apartments. He came back there alone to let Vicky know what was going on. Now, as soon as Lamandre told Vicky that he dropped Tavia off at her sister's apartment, she knew that something was wrong because her other daughter wasn't home. She was in the hospital because she had had some complications after she herself had given birth. So she had no idea what was really going on. But after a few hours passed and Tavia did not return home, her mom contacted the police to report her daughter missing. Once detectives received the report, they spoke with Vicky to try and get more information about Tavia and her whereabouts. Vicky told detectives what she had been told by Lamandre, but also about the fact that Tavia's sister wasn't home, and so it wouldn't have made sense for her to ask to be dropped off there. She also told police that Tavia was five months pregnant, which made the fact that she was missing even more concerning. But there was something else, something disturbing. Vicky told police that a few months before Tavia disappeared, she had been attacked and raped. That night, she had been out with Lamandre when two men carjacked them. Her daughter told her that they were forced out of the car where they were both beaten up. Tavia said that they were separated and she could hear Lamandre yelling. Tavia said that the men kicked her in her stomach and then raped her. When they were finished, they told Lamandre and Tavia that if they told anybody, they would kill their families. Tavia was terrified. When she told her mom, Vicky tried to convince her to call the police and report the attack, but Tavia was too afraid. And because her daughter was 18, she would have had to have been the one to report the crime. Vicky said that after some convincing, Tavia did contact the police to find out what would happen if she did decide to file a report. She asked police if they would be able to offer her family protection if she reported the crime, but police told her that they could not guarantee protection for her or her family. And so Tavia did not make the report. She hoped that this was just something that, as horrifying as it was, something that she could just move on from. But now she was missing. And as the hours went by, her family couldn't help but wonder if these incidents were connected. And once police spoke to Vicky, 
they needed to speak to Lamandre because he was the last person to see her. He was also there when she was attacked months earlier, and so they needed to get his statement. The next day, police went to speak to Lamandre. He told them the same thing that he told Vicky, that he dropped Tavia off at her sister's house and left. He said he had tried to contact her after, but he wasn't able to get a hold of her, and he had no idea where she was. Detectives asked him about the attack a few months earlier, and he confirmed what they had been told by Vicky. But he told them he had no idea who the two men were that attacked them. Now, during that initial conversation, Lamandre was cooperative and answered the detectives' questions. At that point, there was no evidence of foul play, and so police focused in on where Tavia went. Their next mission was to see if there was surveillance footage from the apartment building that would capture Tavia being dropped off. In the meantime, Tavia's family and friends hit the street in an attempt to find her. They canvassed the area and knocked on doors, hoping to find someone who saw something. As one day turned to two, Tavia's family was becoming more and more worried about her well-being. They told detectives that she was a responsible young woman, and this behavior was not like her. And so, while her family searched themselves, police began to take a deeper look into the events the day that Tavia vanished. Was Lamandre telling the truth? Had something else happened to Tavia after he dropped her off? Detectives had no idea. But three days after she went missing, a shocking discovery would bring out the devastating truth. I love the feeling of soaking up the sun this time of year. But with all that time in the sun, I'm always worried about protecting my skin. But with native sunscreen, I can give my skin the protection it needs and soak up some much needed sun. Native's quickly absorbing, ultra sheer, hydrating, and lightweight sunscreen formula offers broad spectrum SPF protection from UVA and UVB rays. All native sunscreen is made with a 20% active zinc oxide formula that is dermatologist tested and suitable for sensitive skin. All native sunscreen is made with oils derived from plants that seal in skin's moisture and is vegan and cruelty free. Choose from one of native's three delicious but subtle scents like coconut and pineapple, rosé, or sweet peach and nectar for your face and body, or try Native's unscented option. I absolutely love Native sunscreen. I use the unscented one, which has a very subtle scent. And unlike other sunscreens, Native is so light, it feels like I'm using regular lotion. I can wear sunscreen that doesn't make me smell like I've been at the beach or the pool all day, which I also love. They also have a separate sunscreen just for your face, which you can use all year round to protect your skin. With all native sunscreen, you get protection from the sun that is free of chemical actives, which makes native sunscreen compliant with the Hawaii Act 104, which was passed in an effort to protect Hawaii's reefs. Give your skin the protection it deserves with native's mineral sunscreens. Go to nativedo.com slash girlgone or use promo code GIRLGONE at checkout to get 20% off your first order. That's native, D-E-O dot com slash GIRLGONE. Or use promo code GIRLGONE at checkout. Native, D-O dot com slash GIRLGONE. Or use promo code GIRLGONE. On September 9th, 2008, 18-year-old Tavia Sills left her home with the father of her unborn child, Lamandre. But a few hours later, he returned without Tavia, claiming he dropped her off at her sister's house. Problem was, her sister wasn't home, and Tavia knew that. When she didn't return home that night, her mother reported her missing. And the investigation into what happened to her began. After Tavia's disappearance, police went to her sister's apartment building where Lamandre said he dropped her off to get surveillance footage. 
They needed to determine whether or not she had actually been dropped off, and if so, where she had gone afterwards. But when police get the footage, they realize that something is very wrong because there are no signs of Tavia or Lamandre on any of the footage. Despite his initial cooperation, detectives now knew that Lamandre had lied to them. And so he quickly became a person of interest. The problem was, they still did not know where Tavia was or have any evidence that foul play was involved. But three days after Tavia vanished, their search for her would come to a heartbreaking end. On September 12th, 2008, two people were out fishing at a pond in Shreveport when they noticed something strange floating in the water. When they took a closer look, they realized it was a body. They called the police, who arrived at the scene shortly after. When the body was pulled from the water, it was face down and was badly decomposed. When they first pulled the body out, police were not sure who their victim was. But once the body was turned over, they could see that the victim was visibly pregnant. And they knew immediately that it was Tavia, the missing pregnant teenage girl. Tavia had been shot to death. She had three gunshot wounds, one at the base of her neck, one in her arm, and the fatal shot was in her back. The mystery about what happened to Tavia was over. The question now was who killed her and why? Once her body was found, detectives armed with the fact that LaMondre had lied to them about dropping Tavia off went back to him so that they could bring him down to the station for questioning. But when they went to his home to pick him up, his mother told them that he wasn't there. She also revealed that LaMondre had a girlfriend, and it wasn't Tavia. Apparently, LaMondre had a two-year-old son with another young woman who he was also in a relationship with, something he hadn't told police. But learning that he also was in another relationship only added to the mounting suspicion of him. Hours later, police located LaMondre, and they brought him into the station They read him his rights, and then around midnight on the 13th, police began interrogating LaMondre. During his interview, he admitted that he had a girlfriend, and he said that him and Tavia were not exclusive. However, he denied involvement in her murder. He repeated the story he told before about dropping her off at the apartment building, but when police confront him with the footage and the fact that he's not seen dropping her off there, He changed his story and claimed that he dropped her off at the corner, outside the range of the surveillance. LaMondre continued to lie to police about what happened that night, but they decided that they had enough to hold him, and so he was transferred to the local jail. Now, once he was safely behind bars, police needed to find more evidence to ensure that they had a strong case for prosecutors. They began interviewing witnesses like LaMondre's sister Alexis, whom he claimed he was bringing Tavia to meet. She told detectives that they had never been to her home that day. They also spoke to Tavia's sister, the one whose house he claimed he dropped her off at, who confirmed that she was in the hospital at that time. And in fact, her sister had been there visiting her earlier that day, which was even more reason why she would not have asked to be dropped off there she knew her sister wasn't home. Detectives also went to speak to the mother of LaMondre's child, and she told them that she and LaMondre had gotten into an argument a few days before Tavia went missing because she found out that Tavia was pregnant. And they also spoke to LaMondre's close friend, who told them that he told her he wanted to beat Tavia up to cause a miscarriage after he found out that she was pregnant. The witness interviews were beginning to paint a picture about why Tavia was killed. Despite LaMondre acting as if he was happy that Tavia was pregnant, based on what the witnesses were saying, he wasn't. While detectives continued to interview witnesses and collect evidence, 
they spoke to LaMondre several times on September 13th. After attending the autopsy, the lead detective on the case went to speak to LaMondre in jail. And he asked if he could call his mom, which the detectives allowed. After that, he sat down with them and admitted that he had taken Tavia down to the pond. He said that once they were down there, he found a tackle box, and inside the box was a gun. He said that he took the gun out, but when he did, it discharged twice, hitting Tavia. LaMondre said that he then ran and threw the gun in a drainage canal. Now, detectives didn't believe LaMondre's story because, first and foremost, they knew that Tavia had been shot three times, not two. They also did not find it plausible that he had happened to find a loaded gun in a tackle box and that it would accidentally go off twice. They continued to interview LaMondre throughout the day. In the meantime, more witnesses were shedding more light on the events surrounding this murder. Another friend of LaMondre said that he had asked him to lie to police and tell them that he saw LaMondre dropping Tavia off. He asked him that the day before her body was found on September 11th. Another friend said that LaMondre told him that he and another friend named Marcus Taylor were at the pond when LaMondre pushed Tavia into the pond and shot her. After he shot her the first time, Tavia asked him what his mother would think, and then he shot her again. Detectives were getting closer to finding out the truth. Each witness added a new piece to the puzzle, and LaMondre, I'm sure, could feel the pressure mounting. Back at the station, police once again interviewed LaMondre, and this time, he had a different story. He confessed to getting a gun from his friend, Marcus Taylor, a few days prior to the shooting. According to LaMondre's account, Marcus joined them at the pond, And he claimed that Marcus offered to teach Tavia how to handle the gun, and he handed it to her. But he said that Tavia was holding the gun wrong, and so he tried to take the weapon, but she didn't let go. And during the struggle, the gun discharged accidentally, not once, but twice, hitting Tavia, wounding her, and she collapsed to the ground. At that point, Marcus told him that they should call the police, but he said he was scared, and so he made a different decision. He pushed Tavia, still clinging to life, into the nearby pond. LaMondre then pointed the gun and fired a fatal shot to make sure that she was dead. And then Marcus got a branch to push her deeper into the water. Sadly, Although the third gunshot would have been fatal on its own, the coroner could not rule out the possibility that Tavia had also succumbed to drowning. LaMondre was officially charged with Tavia's murder. After speaking to him and getting his confession, they brought Marcus Taylor in for questioning, and he confirmed that he had given LaMondre the gun. He also confessed to being there that night pretending to fish, and that LaMondre had told him that he wanted Tavia and their unborn baby dead for months. Marcus was also arrested and charged with Tavia's murder. For her family, it was a devastating revelation that LaMondre, someone Tavia knew and trusted, had lured her to her death. Quote, I don't know what happened. They were childhood friends. They dated in middle school, and again after they got older. They broke up, and all Tay wanted was for him to be a part of the baby's life, Vicky told the Shreveport Times. It was shocking, but they were happy that her murderer had been caught, and now it was time for justice to be served. On March 20th, 2011, the trial began with opening statements. The state laid out its theory of how the crime unfolded, giving a summary of the evidence it planned to present and explaining how that evidence would prove the elements of the crime. 
Meanwhile, the defense, acknowledging the tragedy that had taken place, expressed their sympathy, but they reminded the jury of the state's responsibility to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and urged them to keep an open mind until all the evidence had been presented. Throughout the trial, the state called a total of 22 witnesses to testify. Among them were three members of Tavia's family, four friends and family members of LaMondre, seven law enforcement officers, two obstetricians, a forensic DNA analyst, a firearms examiner, and a forensic pathologist. Surprisingly, when it was the defense's turn to present their case, they chose not to call any witnesses or present any additional evidence. Their decision to rest their case without offering further testimony or evidence was a strategic move on their part. And during the closing arguments, the prosecution highlighted the fact that Tavia and her unborn child were alive and well when last seen with LaMondre. They argued that his intention could be determined from his own admission of firing a final shot to make sure that Tavia was dead. The state also pointed out that LaMondre's story changed multiple times during police interviews. They claimed that he took the life of Tavia to save his relationship with his other girlfriend and pointed out that he has never displayed any remorse. The defense's close was brief. Quote, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I won't go on and on about the evidence presented because, frankly, the facts are not up for debate. What we're here to discuss is the legal analysis. Our stance is straightforward. LaMondre is guilty of second-degree murder for the death of Miss Tavia Sills and the feticide of her unborn child. In other words, he intentionally caused harm to her unborn child, leading to its death. Thank you. That was it. In rebuttal, the state countered by saying that this wasn't a second-degree murder, but a ruthless, premeditated killing. The state vividly painted the picture of the crime to the jury, highlighting the sheer terror that Tavia must have felt. During the state's response, LaMondre caused some kind of commotion, resulting in his removal from the courtroom at the defense's request. Despite this interruption, the state continued with his closing statements, underscoring LaMondre's choice to not seek medical help and instead choosing to push Tavia into the water and shoot her again. Based on these chilling actions, the state argued that the crime was far too calculated and cold-hearted to be classified as a second-degree murder. It took the jury just 30 minutes to find LaMondre guilty. And in June 2011, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Marcus Taylor was also found guilty after his trial in October 2013, and he was sentenced to 30 years. In an interesting turn of events, LaMondre's mom was arrested and charged alongside her son with jury tampering. She was charged after she made contact with a potential juror and then facilitated a three-way call between her son and the juror, where they told them that they couldn't convict unless everyone agreed. The call was, of course, recorded, and LaMondre's mom was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. LaMondre tried unsuccessfully to appeal his conviction, but it was upheld by the Louisiana Supreme Court. Tavia's murder was truly senseless. LaMondre killed her because he didn't want to be the father to her baby. But what's really crazy is that during the trial, DNA revealed that LaMondre was not the father of Tavia's baby. It was the motive for this murder, and come to find out that LaMondre wasn't even the father. I wonder how stupid he felt when he found out that had he just waited four months, he could have had a DNA test prove that he wasn't the father. And he could have simply just moved on with his life and gone on to play football. But instead, he took the coward's way out. 
and killed an innocent young girl who had her whole life ahead of her. And now he will be executed by the state. Tavia was just 18 years old. A child still herself, really. But at least justice has been served. And her killer will never be able to hurt anyone again. May Tavia Sills rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new story. In the meantime, make sure you follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter.